first. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, colleagues, uh, friends, this is our last session, and the um, arrangements are to have a general discussion, and uh, hopefully you have an opportunity to have read the paper circulated uh, this morning, which is a brief draft of some sentiments, some ideas as a final statement. Uh, perhaps I could just take a few minutes to explain the methodology in preparing the draft and uh, the thinking that went into it. Yes, there is a copy, uh, I believe, in Spanish for our Spanish-speaking speaking, uh, speaking friends. So if, they, if you need a copy, it can be circulated. This one over here that's required as well. Just wait till Margaret t takes her seat. We're just getting ready to st start the final session. That's all right, no problem. Well, you, you timed it very well. It was rather soft. <laughs> it's a soft bell. Okay, there's, a, there's someone over here. The two people over here want to, the, uh, to be in Spanish. So just, we've just circulated the paper. Okay, I just want to say a few words about the methodology in drafting this, and then uh, I think it's a case of just letting it open to the floor to hear uh, comments and uh, discussion. Um, it is a very difficult job, as you can appreciate, to encapsulate the rich diversity of opinions, the detail of analysis, and the personal experiences that are shared by, every, by various people in the room over the last three days. It is touching and indeed a very moving moment to hear the personal examples of individual triumph over the odds, where it is quite clear the dignity of a person has transcended the terrible traumas they've suffered and the atrocious acts of violence that they have experienced. Rarely is it the case that people can express themselves so clearly as has been articulated in our discussions over this weekend. And I'm grateful for the candor, but privileged to hear the voices that I've heard. And I mean that because it is always the case that having heard from personal experience one leaves the room better and deeper in understanding and empathy with the human condition that affects many people in different parts of the world. So thank you for that. Human efforts at drafting have got to be recognized for the fragility with which drafting is done in haste, often in a spirit of trying to encapsulate ideas that are complex and sometimes uh, what appears in print may not represent entirely what everyone wants to see. If you expect too much, you will be disappointed. <laughs> it is clear. If you don't expect too much, you might be surprised. <laughs> the generosity of exchange should encourage you to look kindly on any attempt to bring together ideas on a difficult subject that transfers from law, sociology, economics, just human understanding into a single document. It cannot be done. I am not the United Nations, nor am I skilled uh, with a set of typists or people who can help me put together the words. So what you see is clearly a draft. But it is in the spirit of a statement that it sets out a dialogue an exchange between us all. It may not answer what everyone wants, but exchanges are about communication and better understanding. So my approach was, first of all, to get out of the whole discourse what I call some of the pillars that should inform how we think about the subject. So there is, if you like, in the legal terminology, we call it a preamble, but that is too legalistic. There's a set of statements which have been taken from the Council of Europe Convention and also on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. 
And in order to take us forward, I thought, as I discussed it with many people in this room and some who have just left, that Pope Francis did express himself very well in terms of humanity and the crimes against humanity. So I put together um, some ideas about the violation of dignity that included the exploitive systems, trafficking by human beings involving prostitution, trade in organs, and forced labor. And as Papa Francesco says, they are crimes against humanity. It doesn't do more than that. There are opportunities for people to express what that may mean in their own particular context, but it is a start. It is a continuity of what has been said in the past, so if people have read the various discussions that have gone on in the Pontifical Academy, it fits where we have been. And then the attempt to take us forward was to go through what I call a victim's charter. The word charter uh, may be ambiguous, but it comes from the idea of setting out a roadmap or a guide to the various things that we thought were needed in terms of rehabilitation, resettlement, and reintegration into society. They are bullet points. They're not definitive rules or regulations. They are, if you like, a minimum beginning of where we can take the roadmap to a better place. There is a notion of pathway, the pathway that a survivor or a victim has to go through to come to terms with where they are, to have time to think and to time to recover from the ordeal they have suffered, and then to take a new path, hopefully, to a better place. The impediments are many. The obstacles are often legal, bureaucratic, and financial. We make, I make no bones about the difficulty, but insofar as setting out aspirations, this is an attempt to do so. A word about detail. Yes, it is possible to have produced a five, ten page summary of what everything had been said. But that is, I think, at a level where principles get so cluttered up with the detail that it's very difficult to get any sense of it. People have time to read, but they often read very short and, to a large extent, succinct points. If I've omitted something, I apologize. If I've included something that you object to, by all means, tell me. But there are moments when you have to draw the line, and last night at a certain hour, I thought that was the moment. So it's as entirely arbitrary as that. More time, more space would allow this to be a better document. And maybe in that spirit, we should see this as an important moment in the evolution of the way in which we talk to each other about these matters. So that's the methodology. Put simply, it is where I've got to in the written form, but it doesn't follow that that's where it should stop. It may go further than that. So I've said enough, and uh, I will then go into the mode of listening to your comments. Uh, obviously, if there are things you want to amend or ideas, etc., we'll, we'll try and accommodate it. Let me also say that it may not be possible for everything to be done in the short time we have. So it may take longer. So at least let's start the conversation now and see how we get on. Uh, I hope no one wants to reject the entire document. That would be a bit embarrassing, if not to say the least difficult for me to go on. But uh, assuming that that's not quite the case, I've not heard anyone who wants to tear it up completely. So at least uh, it's in front of us. Um, I was going to put up PowerPoints, but to be honest, I think we're all very tired. I hope you have a, a hard copy. So is that uh, agreed that we just deal with a hard copy? I think you don't have a hard copy. So you have a hard copy. So the hard copy will be all right, yeah? Because I think it's too, too, too late in the day to have more slides and dim lights. All right, so um, we shall go. Uh, Jamie, you will act just to simply take people's names in the order. If I'm writing, I can't see everyone's name, so excuse that. Okay, thank you for your understanding. Thank you. Don't all speak at once. I can only write so fast. Thank you. Starting with Father Buonaiuto. 
Thank you. I have spare copies here if you need them. Sorry, you had your hand up. I ask to speak Italian. <coughs> Ho sentito diversi interventi sul, sull'importanza del contrasto della prostituzione schiavizzata e quindi di coloro che sono i primi responsabili di questo mercato, e cioè i clienti. Ho sentito parlare del modello nordico molto importante e anche noi in Italia, e chiedo aiuto a tutti voi, anche noi eh, abbiamo eh, quest'anno attivato in Italia una campagna che si vede dal sito, il sito italiano questo è il mio corpo.org, per dire di fermare la domanda, quindi personalmente ma anche le associazioni se possono aderire per aiutare l'Italia ci fate un grande dono, un grande ausilio, un grande sostegno per dire anche in Italia di, ad di adottare il modello nordico che sta funzionando molto bene anche l'anno scorso in Francia. E quindi questa è la prima richiesta che faccio per aiutare il nostro Paese. E poi nella dichiarazione non ho visto una, una, una parola, non so se mi è sfuggita, ma non vedo nessuna parola sulla richiesta di fermare la domanda e quindi il, di citare il cliente come il primo responsabile e quindi contrastare l'acquisto del corpo umano per motivi sessuali, per tutti i motivi e per i motivi eh, eh, perché abbiamo parlato di questa società che ha la mentalità della prostituzione. Noi in Italia non chiamiamo queste ragazze prostitute, noi le chiamiamo prostituite. È diverso, è il sistema che prostituisce, ma le donne sono prostituite, cioè sono costrette a prostituirsi. Io vorrei chiedere a Monsignor Sorondo, che è da tanti anni che si occupa di questa piaga e che ha la più grande esperienza, se può portare questa istanza al Santo Padre, vorrei sapere cosa ne pensa, eccellenza, eh, su questo eh, fermare la domanda che il, il Papa possa chiedere a tutti i stati eh, di unirsi su questo metodo, perché sarebbe molto importante. Quindi vorrei sapere anche il suo parere, cosa ne pensa a proposito, per favore. E poi eh, io chiedo anche, eh, chiaramente non per la dichiarazione di oggi, ma come c'è la giornata contro la violenza sulle donne, che ci possa essere anche un riflettere, eh, se si possa nascere una giornata contro la prostituzione schiavizzata. Eh, proprio su questa precisa piaga sociale perché quando si parla di violenze sulle donne non si parla di prostituzione, quando si parla di tratta si parla di tante eh, schiavitù e così il fenomeno della prostituzione spesso passa in secondo, eh, in secondo piano e quindi io chiedo la possibilità di poter analizzare questo, oh, questa iniziativa, una giornata contro la prostituzione e questo aiuterebbe anche a questo cambio di mentalità dove le relazioni più intime non si comprano, non si comprano. Eh, come, come hai, hai potuto vedere dall'applauso eh, mi sembra che il punto è molto importante, bisogna aggiungere. Forse tu puoi redattare quello che vuoi in italiano, eh? esattamente il punto che vuoi, però sono d'accordo con te, è un punto fondamentale. Cioè la responsabilità del cliente, è la prima responsabilità e qui non figura, è vero. traffickers. I don't know how you can morally accept 
the undoubtedly high fees that have been paid for your airfares to come to a meeting to talk about something different from what you have been invited for? It's, I would all, have to, it's all connected. I would have to agree that... It's not uh, different, Margaret. It's, it's in one of the points. It's in one of the points. Because this is a, is, a, is, a, is a form also to assist, the, to, to have some assistance. It's, you, you put the private question, but it, someone speak about the, 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 the model of the state, and this is a model of the state, to help the people. I think. Best practices. Yeah, this is a practice of the state. It's the best practice for the state. It's a this is a best practice for the private people, but this is a best practice for the state to condemn the, the, the consumers. This is a very good practice to avoid, to avoid, to many people speak here, to avoid the, the prostitution, we need to do this practice. What does it have to do with resettlement? It's, it's part of the resettlement because it's prevention. If prevention is part of the, of the question. Many people speak here about prevention. Okay, I saw hands in this order. First, uh, Linda, then Sister Leah, and then Rosie. And then, sorry, I keep neglecting my left hand side. My suggestion relates to the Victims' Charter, and it follows on from the many interjections we've had relating to the voice of victims. Rather than speaking of the voice of victims, I believe we need to give them their more appropriate status as experts by experience. We need to always respect and affirm their expertise when they share it with us. Additionally, we must build in trauma-informed support within our events where they speak to ensure that they are supported effectively when they so generously share their experience with us, particularly as the unintended consequences of interactions from the floor may be the cause of distress. And I say that as, as somebody who spent a lot of years running conferences or being at conferences where what I would refer to as experts by experience speak, and sometimes that they have been neglected when they've shared things that have actually generated trauma for them or reminded them of things that they've experienced. I have written the wording down and so can, can give it if that's helpful, but I would be suggesting that it needs to be in there in the victim's charter as a way of working because actually we cannot exclude their expertise if we're to ensure that we work effectively yeah. to deal with what they've experienced. Can I just ask a, a point of clarification? Uh, this is very important. Is it acceptable, the words victims charter, all right? The yes. word charter. I took the charter concept from the basis of Magna Carta, the yeah. big charter, <coughs> and it may, it, it's not necessarily the best word because it could be, we could use other words, but the idea behind it was not about voice at all. It was entitlement. I, I, you, you, we're on the same page. I, I, we're on the same page, and I completely Thank agree. You. Thank you. I just just as sure. the word victim is uncomfortable, but it's the victimhood yes. that gives them well, rights in okay. law. So I completely understand, but I think for us, we need to be really clear about how we work. Can you hear me? Would you mind if I gave the floor first to Pamela and then to you? Thank you. Gracias. Pero tiene mucho que ver que también se criminalice al cliente, porque muchas veces, bueno, yo en mi caso, en mi experiencia personal, que fui víctima, muchas veces en, el, en los cuartos de hotel, yo le rogaba a los clientes, pedía ayuda a los clientes, es más, uno de los clientes fue policía y le pedí ayuda a él y llorando, 
¿Y qué hacían? Ellos no, no les importaba y me decían, a mí no me importa tú lo que estás pasando, yo pagué por un servicio. Entonces, digo, si no hay un, un apoyo del gobierno pa, o del Estado para que los clientes igual sean criminalizados, porque realmente si no hubiera clientes, no hubiera demanda, y si no hubiera demanda, no hubiera gente que esté siendo explotada sexualmente o explotada laboralmente. Entonces, sí es muy importante que haya penalizaciones como, eh, creo que en el gobierno de Francia o de Canadá estaban diciendo de que se está penalizando. Entonces, debería ser algo como mundialmente esto para que ya no haya ni desaparecidas, ni haya lo que sea explotación en ninguno de los tipos que hemos hablado y de los que existen. Gracias. Thank you very much, Sister Leo. Thank you. I was very happy when I heard from the Nordic model because it was a change of view. We were all, always looking at the women, how the women behave, how the women were, were dressed up. I speak of the, of the pre-chattis in Germany. Uh, women could always make something wrong. They couldn't walk with, uh, so. And when I heard the Nordic model, the view was on the other side, was on the, on the consumer, and it was said, what they are doing is a crime. And that's right. And then uh, I feel also we cannot put all the problems in a, uh, in a law or in a, in a cry out. I feel it's so awful what's happened to women through prostitu uh, prostitution. We never say prostitute. We always say women who are touched by prostitution because we feel it's such a, in, in Germany, I hear it here also, as was said, but the women have chosen that. A prostitution is always that was as long as human being, and I always say, it, as young as human are being, they are stealing and they are murdering, and we have laws who forbid that. And all the, all the days, there is murder and there is stealing. But we don't never say, let go with this law, so I don't do anything. So for me, it would be very good if we could um, bring this, uh, uh, to have this uh, Nordic model. Uh, I like much more the, uh, the, the sex cow verbot. I say it in German because I don't feel the word in the moment. I feel that would be very good. And if the Pope could write on the Bishop Conference a letter to, uh, to put on this problem, that would also be something I would have asked the Pope if I could have had a, med a meeting with him. Uh, it's so necessary that the bishops, the church, is taking clear lines and saying that is a, is a crime on women and it's forbidden to buy sex. So I, I think uh, I fully endorse what the uh, father has said. Thank you. So for the question of the Pope, write a letter, also in German, one page. Thank you very much. Many issues have come out, and thank God that they are coming out, all these issues, because we really need to be serious. I think, first of all, there is no need to, to ask the Pope to write a letter. The Pope has given the mandate to this, in this place, to this academy, to study the problem and to give our vision. And uh, the experience that we have brought in in these days, I think, they, are very, they have been very, very clear. We are all against trafficking. 
and we are all against the buyers because if there are no buyers, there will be no trafficking. And many times that I've been going on the Salaria to meet the girls, and how many times they say, I would not be here if for one month no one comes look for me. I will not be here on the street because nobody will have any, my madame will not have, have any profit if I don't bring money back. But if I am here, it's because every night I am asked and used and throw away. And if I think that in a Catholic country like Italy, if we have nine million clients, is it not yet time to say enough is enough? And we have to be very strong from this place to say no, prostitution is illegal and prostitution and the buyers should be the ones to be condemned in order to help the society to be more healthy. Why do we have so much violence against women? There are no more rules. No more are saying, now this is wrong. And to try to, to help our young people in schools to understand what means respect, to understand what means, uh, you know, uh, the relationship with another person. Not because you pay, you can buy the body of a minor. What do you pay? Is not a packet of cigarette that you go on the supermarket to buy and to, uh, and to smoke. Now a person has the right to be protected, to not to be used for your own sake, for your own uh, um, desires. So now I think that we have the responsibility today to say very strongly, prostitution is wrong. And moreover, you know, the demand has to be condemned. So that is, uh, you know, for the ones who has been suffering together with these victims, what they have been going through. And uh, I think that this is the right time that we have the courage to say all together in one voice, because this is what we have been here for. Otherwise, we keep on coming, having these uh, beautiful meetings. We go away, and things are going to be the same. No, I'm no longer coming. Eh? If things are still going to be the same, Monsignor, I'm no longer coming to discuss the same things over and over again. OK? Thank you very much. Attila. Just maybe a little practical note. I don't think the Pope's passion about the problem is in question. I think he's been very articulate. Now, the difference between being articulate and able to uh, implement it is always different. And I think realistically speaking, to go to the bishops and say, this is one more issue, take it on. He'll say it, but I think any of us involved in the church here know that's not gonna be pursued. Maybe our approach to the Holy Father would be to have every Episcopal conference and every bishop appoint a director of anti-trafficking. You know, we have liturgists, we have all kind of different directors of things in our diocese, maybe just a more practical way to approach it, and we may get more traction that way. You might find a priest who's well-suited in a diocese who could really affect some good with the bishop's blessing, take it off his plate. I think there's just a practical way to approach it. I think uh, to approach the Holy Father and say, we're not, you're not doing enough, you know, he, he's going to say, I've, I've done a great deal. Make the bishops do it. He's going to say, you make them do it. I ask them stuff all the time. But if we do something that ask them to 
an anti-trafficking director per diocese, effectively we may gain some traction and some help there. Can I ask a question on that? Because I've seen in uh, Father Behi, can I ask a question? <laughs> I've seen in, in several American churches now a social justice person designated in a social justice ministry. So I'm wondering if that, I, I like your practical approach. I'm wondering if that could be utilized for anti-human anti -human trafficking purposes. Utilize the structure that's already there. So in, in a lot well, of churches, I've been seeing the social justice ministry. Social justice in, uh, ministry, the most immediate and the most important. You take any diocese with refugee resettlement, the social justice, the poverty, you know, the racism and everything. If it all goes up under the umbrella, it'll be one of the many things. Oh, we all have social justice committees. I think more specifically, if it was anti-trafficking, I think it, it may get more attention than one of eight or 10 or 12 uh, issues they have to deal with in that diocese. That's just a recommendation. Okay, Melissa. Um, in, in the interest of being specific, um, if you look at the kind of confusion around the issue of trafficking in this room, the thought of sending out a invitation to bishops to have a trafficking <clears throat> mission seems uh, seems a little problematic. I would say get very specific. What about this group provides a Nordic model information team that it sends out to all the bishops and that um, since there's agreement that we want to end demand, we want to criminalize sex buyers or customers, why not explain some details about the, the Nordic model and pass that out? I'd just like to make the point that um, it's not possible or wise to try to um, separate sex trafficking and prostitution. We've heard earlier today about the way that um, legalized systems and decriminalized systems, any kind of environment that encourages prostitution automatically raises sex trafficking within that region. So for that reason alone, they're indivisible. Um, and there's also the issue, and I wish I could remember the woman I'm about to quote, I wish I could remember her name, it was a, an American feminist who said that to look at sex trafficking while ignoring prostitution was like looking at the middle passage while ignoring the plantations. And that was the most succinct explanation that I have ever heard of why these issues are indivisible. Thank you. Rosie. Thank you. Thank you for all the effort, and we really appreciate so many things good for the victims. But we have to see the heart of the victims. Every time they were bought by somebody that some countries call only Johns, when they are taken to other countries where they are criminalized, like Marta, who was being by she said every time she was by, <laughs> a little piece of her humanity was being dying. So for them, it's part of the healing to see that our countries will start to punish the clients. No Jones, name and last name, that they will be in the newspaper as criminals, that they will be shown, because they were doing this in the dark, and they were disappearing from homes. In Mexico, we have so many families who has daughters has been disappearing. Mm -hmm. And every time one of these men buys one of these girls, another girl 
will disappear. So I think that is crucial for the healing, for the restoration, for the protection, for the prevention of the victims. Thank you. Now we're gonna go to the left side because sorry, we've been ignored. Um, starting at the end there, and then I think everybody in line wanted to say something. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Becca Johnson, I'm a licensed psychologist, and I'm the International Program Director for Rescue Freedom International. Um, I have traveled a lot around the world helping restoration programs, both residential and non-residential. And one of the things that I have come to realize and do is I've become quite an advocate for the inclusion of the trauma-focused emotional healing components. So I appreciate the charter and that we have focused much on the legal compensation and the legal issues. And, the, and this charter does say other services. In fact, the quote says additional services or makes, let's make sure we connect people with other resources available. And I just want to go on record to say that we need to make sure we include opportunities for emotional healing. When we look at the domains of impairment, from trauma, or some people may call that trauma symptoms, we see that six of the seven domains of impairment from multiple or complex trauma deal with psychological or emotional issues. Only one of the seven deals with biological or physiological uh, ramifications or symptoms after a trauma. I attended a, a large anti-trafficking conference many years ago in a large city. And I, there was a seminar entitled, The Key to Aftercare or Assistance, you know, the key to help for the assisting victims of human trafficking. And of course, I went to the seminar, and they said that uh, the key was to find the person a job. And where I thought that's helpful for uh, self-esteem and that's helpful for uh, finances, it didn't address the issues of shame and our guilt or those other deeper issues. And we find that when people aren't given opportunities to fully address the emotional impact of trauma, that the recidivism or the rate of them returning to a life of exploitation is increased, as well as the, they will continue living a shame-filled life. When they are given opportunities for emotional healing, and restoration, we find that the, the, um, the freedom increases and a hope-filled life continues. So we, we don't want to offer just case management, or some places will say, oh, we offer an art class or yoga or something like that. I want to encourage and challenge all of us with our programs to make sure we provide those opportunities. And this is what I travel and train and do. I've become an advocate for this. So whether it's a residential program or a non-residential program, I think it's imp important that we include not just that we are trauma-informed or that we help trauma victims, but that we provide trauma-focused care. There's a lot of best practices and programs out there that help us um, in knowing what that means, what we can provide. So again, I thank you that this document talks about the importance of meeting the food, clothing, and shelter, meeting the legal needs with the immigration, with the visa status, with repar reparations and compensation. We know the importance of, of uh, the educational or vocational opportunities, finding them those jobs. But I just again want to state that under those additional services, and those uh, resources available, may we please be sure to include those uh, opportunities for tra uh, intentional trauma-focused emotional recovery and restoration. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I'm just a lowly parish priest, uh, but I did hear four times throughout the weekend that we need parish involvement. So I'm gonna give you a three little quick Twitter versions of what you can do very quickly. As a priest who's overworked and tired and there's very few of us, uh, one thing we can do that's doable is every 
Catholic parish in the world is required to give an annual report to the Vatican. In the annual report, we could add a GL, a line that says human trafficking committee. And you, it means you have to do something for that and you have to check the box. The second thing we can do is in our financial report, again, every parish has to send this to his bishop who then sends it to the, the Vatican. In there, you would have a GL, a line that shows not just social justice expenses, which we currently have now in most dioceses, but why can't we add a GL for truly human trafficking alone? Showing how, for how we spend our money shows what we love. And we need to change our budgets to address this. The third thing we can do is in communication. And we need to recognize that not just you guys have a hard time getting bishops to respond, my bishop and I, and I've talked about this, he can't get his priests to respond to him. So what we've come up with is, we now go directly to the laity in every parish. And so lay uh, involvement, and we CC the priests on all, on all communication, because now we know it'll be enacted. And the final thing is on resettlement, a big part of the conference. Uh, we've done that in our, I've personally done that, uh, in, in welcoming a Syrian refugee family. And when the prisoners were reluctant to give up their home, well, I gave them my home, the priest home, and I rented the house. And so we had a bishop very supportive of refugees. And I want to say there's other dioceses in our country, in Canada, where bishops have actually said to every parish, I want you to sponsor a Syrian or a refugee family. This kind of aggressive leadership from our clergy, I believe are concrete ways in which parishes can do a tangible and hands-on meaningful uh, response to what you're looking for. I hope it helps. Please. Gracias a todos. Eh, yo lo que quería resaltar en relación al documento era que ayer cuando hablábamos sobre la terminología, ¿sí? ¿se acuerdan el debate? Que eh, nosotros acá nos estamos pronunciando en contra de la explotación. ¿Sí? Nos, nos pronunciamos en contra de la explotación laboral, ¿sí? nos pronunciamos en contra del tráfico de órganos y nos pronunciamos en contra de la explotación sexual. Cuando hablamos de explotación sexual, no se entiende, o sea, como para que exista explotación, tiene que haber una relación de poder, Ixchar lo explicó clarísimo, eh, tiene que haber una relación de poder donde sí o sí hay una persona ¿sí? que, que, que está dispuesta a consumir a un otro, a, 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 a consumir, eh, prim, en primer lugar, si produce una ropa a un costo muchísimo más barato y hay una explotación laboral en, en ese caso, que es lo más común en mi país, en, en los casos de explotación laboral, ¿sí? eh, hay alguien que está dispuesto a comprar esa remera a dos pesos. ¿sí? Bueno, cuando nos pronunciamos en contra de la explotación eh, sexual, ¿sí? hay otra persona que está dispuesto a comprarlo. ¿Sí? Entonces, es, in, pero es fundamental porque acá hay una, una bajada de línea y una, una hoja de ruta para las parroquias, pero para el mundo entero. Y muchísimos organismos internacionales, ¿sí? utilizando mal la terminología, favorecen ¿sí? la explotación. Entonces, nosotros acá tenemos una posibilidad muy concreta ¿Sí? de pronunciarnos en contra. Y hace años que yo como participo de encuentros y siempre somos minoría. Entonces yo eh, en esta oportunidad me siento eh, agradecida de haber podido escuchar a tantas personas que de verdad pensamos que hay que abolir este sistema injusto que reproduce la explotación de las personas, la trata de personas, que esto fue lo que discutimos. Entonces, tiene que quedar clarísimo, como lo, como lo dijo también Rachel, jamás se puede pensar que estamos hablando del el, el trabajo sexual no existe. ¿sí? 
Entonces, cuando organismos internacionales, al no pronunciarse o pronunciarse a favor, son funcionales. Entonces, es muy importante desde acá poder dar una posición ¿sí? en contra de la prostitución, ¿sí? de, del sistema prostibulario, del de el prostituyente, como le decimos, para poder eh, de verdad transformarlo. Es esto, una relación de poder. Y bueno, eso. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Can I direct everybody's attention to the preamble? Because maybe we just skipped right over it. But we have in the preamble, as stated by Pope Francis, trafficking by human beings and the exploitative systems fed by it, such as prostitution, trade in organs, and forced labor are crimes against humanity and violate the dignity and integrity of the human person. These crimes should be recognized as such and penalized in order to eradicate them. Okay, please. Th thank you very much indeed. And, and I wanted to address uh, precisely the preamble. Uh, nothing to say uh, to change, but possibly to add two sentences. And uh, it will be to inscribe, I must say, to, to put our efforts in the framework of next year's two anniversaries, the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which was adopted in New York on the 10th of December 1948. So the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And then uh, the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the statute of the International Criminal Court in Rome on the 17th of July, 1998. And as you guess, both documents are clearly linked to the issues we are discussing here. Okay, thank you very much. Can I just uh, add a point to that? Uh, you're absolutely right, and I'm delighted you remind me. Um, embarrassingly, my concern was that the United Kingdom may have left both by the date, <laughs> and that's perhaps the psychological uh, problem I had with including it. But I do think it's worth uh, putting it in, as you say. Thank you for that. Kate, please. There we go. So I think I have three things based on the second page of the recommendations. So I think one is a question, one is an addition, and one is a suggested change. So in um, point two, um, supporting victims, support provided by the state should be linked to the acknowledging of the needs and then the minimum requirements. And I suppose the question is, is this something that the academy could assist in terms of providing an evidence base for and research for what are the minimum standards and what are the needs? So we've spoken a lot about those two things in the last few days, but I think lots of people view them slightly differently. So is that something that the research and the academy could help with? Um, I think then on paragraph four, starting support for the victims should include, um, as I explained earlier, in the UK, the law does not allow somebody to remain, and politicians have very clearly stated this will not be the case. And I wonder whether we just need to add something in around where the law doesn't allow this. It doesn't negate the need for a package of resettlement still, so they may not have status, but they still need access to services within the, the framework that they are working within. Um, and then the final one is the third paragraph from the end, where it says government and local authorities responsible for resettlement. Um, again, I'm not sure that government and local authorities are necessarily responsible for resettlement, so I maybe change that to those responsible for, because then it gives a wider, depending on all the different countries we're working within, it gives the widest possible. Yeah. So those are my three things, thanks. Okay, can I just uh, respond to those points? Um, the first point about um, the need for research, I think that was extremely well put um, by our discussion earlier this, this afternoon from Mr. Roy, who mentioned this as a point that Caritas was involved in, and it's, some, it's a theme I would pick up with the Academy in future developments. On the second uh, question about um, access and so on, I think you're right about this, that. Um, there is an issue about the right of remaining. It is, um, however, an issue that lawyers argue about, um, but I think that you're right to raise it as a question of doubt. I mean, 
you're quite right that ministers have said what they say, but ministers do not make the law in that way. It's courts that make the law in this context. So I think that it's a point that would perhaps re re require a little bit of clarification. Uh, the bit about government, local government authorities responsible, it's that ambiguity about the distinction between legal responsibilities. It doesn't say legal responsible. It actually um, used the word responsible in the lay sense of administrative uh, dumping, I think I'd use the word rather than responsible, but it's a fair point. Uh, I think Mar I will look at this again, but it's a good point to raise because um, it's certainly the direction of travel in the United Kingdom, but in other jurisdictions I know there is responsibility shared, so it's a fair point to make. Thank you for that. All those are very helpful points. Yes? Yes, thank you. Uh, three things. One, first on the text, second on criminalization, and third about us, because this is a vi victim's charter. Okay. On the text, so on the first paragraph, I would start with recovery and introduce the idea of trauma healing, which was given uh, earlier. I think it's very important to put, and put it right at the beginning there. Now, the word resettlement, as I said earlier, and especially the way it is written in the middle of, the, of page two, supporting victims' resettlement in the country of destination, what are we speaking of? Because th that is resettlement. It's people moving from one place to another and being resettled. Are we speaking of this with victims of trafficking? So if that is the case, because many people stay where they are, they are not moved to another place. Um, so, if we are clear about what we mean by resettlement, which is moving to another place, then that's okay. Um, the last, the before last paragraph, that's very, about human trafficking should be including in anti-money laundering proceedings, that's concrete proposal, which I would link to the fourth paragraph, which is victims of trafficking should have access to compensation, so I would link the two. And the last one, which is a very concrete thing, dissemination of information and understanding about the plight of victims should be enhanced by creating a video for the use of ordinary parishes. Um, I would include that. So uh, in another, um, another paragraph, which is we, we, because there's a victim's charter, the victims, but we as organizations, I would say we commit, and especially if we have to sign it somehow, we commit, one, to work together, two, to do more research, you have to phrase it in the right way, three, bring all of this to our religious leaders. We spoke of bishops, but I think there are other religious leaders which is to be engaged and so the idea of a reference person in the diocese for anti-trafficking or the annual parish report, etc., could come into that. We bring it to our religious leaders. And fourth, to uh, reinforce uh, communication and education on this topic, which, is, which could include the last paragraph that you put there. So we commit to work together, to do more research, to bring it to our religious leaders, and to educate our people. Um, and one point, which is about criminalization. So in the char charter itself, when we speak of governments, we speak of support to victims. But one of the support to bring to victims is to recognize the, uh, the responsibility of the, I wouldn't say clients, because clients is really linked to prostitution. I would, sp I would speak of exploiters. I don't know if that's the right word in English, but bring every, bring all human trafficking issues under one word, like exploiters. Um, so, and criminalization of exploiters. I think this is a responsibility of, of, of governments that should be put into the charter itself. Thank you. Alicia. Bueno. Primero, antes que nada, gracias por todo el trabajo que hicieron, porque se quedaron muchas horas para hacer este trabajo. Eh, después, eh, concuerdo con usted en esto de, de poner eh, el tema de la reparación, el tema de no re, ayúdeme, reasentamiento, porque hay víctimas que se quedan, 
Eh, y en el tema de reparación, yo sé que eso es una cuestión que corresponde a lo jurídico y la semana que viene, ah, perdón, esta semana tienen el simposio de jueces y habría que retomar el tema, pero cuando se habla de reparación y el compromiso nuestro, podríamos poner en algún párrafo, ayúdenme, esto de tratar de declarar el delito de lesa humanidad. Y ahí eh, todo lo que sea reparación civil y todo lo demás, indemnización y bla, 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 está todo incluido. ¿sí? Pero habría que agregarle esa frase de delito de lesa humanidad, que nos comprometemos a tratar y a lograr y apoyar para que sea declarado. Eh, en cuanto al otro, está, me parece que está muy, está muy completo y coincido con usted. Yo venía pensando lo que usted venía diciendo y lo, vení, lo había elaborado. Así que, bueno, creo que incorporando las cosas que usted está pidiendo, la palabra explotadores hace alusión a los traficantes solamente. Solamente. ¿Sí? Para nosotros. Para nosotros. ¿Eh? Muchas gracias. Gracias por darme la palabra. Cato Guerrero. Muchas gracias. Eh, yo tenía dos propuestas que hacer. La primera con respecto a lo que se ha estado hablando de la inclusión eh, de la penalización eh, del consumidor o del cliente en esta carta de las víctimas. Yo creo, sinceramente, que con una visión holística y desde el punto de vista de la protección de las víctimas y de la atención a las víctimas, no hay mayor protección a las víctimas que penalizar a quienes las están consumiendo y a quienes las están, eh, y a quienes las están explotando. Entonces, pienso, pienso que desde el punto de vista de la protección es indispensable incluir este punto, porque todos sabemos que mientras haya un solo consumidor, un solo explotador, como decía el señor Roy, bueno, habrá una víctima y la víctima estará en peligro. No podemos pretender atender, asistir a las víctimas con una política meramente asistencialista para darles cobijo, para darles vivienda, para darles formación, etcétera, que está muy bien y es muy necesaria. Pero si no hacemos una política total para acabar contra la causa originaria de las diferentes formas de trata, no las estaremos protegiendo de verdad. Entonces, me parece muy importante, porque si esto es una carta de las víctimas, me parece que la primera demanda que nos harían las víctimas de incluir en esta carta sería que penalizáramos a quienes las están consumiendo y a quienes las están explotando. Y desde ese punto de vista me parece totalmente pertinente esta inclusión. Como segundo punto, yo también haría una nueva edición, porque también si esto es una carta de las víctimas, me parece que echo un poquito de menos en esta carta un reconocimiento del trabajo de las organizaciones, de la sociedad civil, en todo, el, en todo el tema de la atención a las víctimas. Yo creo que hay que poner en esta carta el papel que realmente están desempeñando todas las ONGs, la, la, la sociedad civil, puesto que los gobiernos y los estados de todo el mundo están depositando la responsabilidad de la atención a las víctimas en estas organizaciones, sí que deberíamos exigir que estas organizaciones sean dotadas presupuestariamente del dinero que necesitan para atender efectiva, efectivamente a las víctimas, que no tengan que estar permanentemente mendigándolo y que además tengan el puesto que les corresponde en este sistema general de atención y de protección. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Yo tengo dos propuestas para el documento. Eh, Partiendo de lo que está como lo que habían puesto del Papa, que señala prostitución, comercio de órganos y trabajo forzado, entonces veo tres líneas, que sería el comercio de órganos y en la prostitución sería esclavitud sexual, dos puntos, prostitución y trata. La propuesta concreta es que se pueda dividir en la carta, hay puntos comunes para todas las víctimas, ya sea de tráfico de órganos, de esclavitud sexual o de trabajos forzados. Hay varios de los puntos que ponen. ¿Cómo? ¿No se escucha? Ah. Ok, lo digo más despacio. Bueno, la propuesta es, se señalan tres tipos de, de víctimas, que serían las víctimas de esclavitud sexual, que involucra prostitución y trata, las de trabajos forzados y comercio de órganos. La propuesta... ¿Voy bien? Okay. 
la propuesta es que se pueda dividir la carta a las víctimas a partir de estos tres tipos de víctimas que hay, de esclavitud sexual, de tráfico de órganos y de trabajos forzados. Dividiéndola, hay puntos que señalan que son en común para todas las víctimas, para estos tres tipos de delitos, pero hay puntos que son específicos. Creo que sería conveniente que especifica, especificáramos en cada uno de estos. Por ejemplo, la sanción a los consumidores, supongo que del Mónico, no, que ahorita no está, nos podría apoyar para ver el que tiene claro cómo es el tema del tráfico de órganos, quiénes son los consumidores, cómo son estos y cómo se podría sancionar. Yo no tengo idea de cómo sancionar a los consumidores de tráfico de órganos, pero en el caso de la esclavitud sexual, que es creo que de, donde, de lo que más se ha hablado aquí, hay varias vías, una ya es el modelo sueco que nos planteaban y la ley francesa, que podemos tomar como ejemplo y entonces ahí viene la sanción a los consumidores, o sea, ponerlo de forma diferenciada. Y la otra es redactaría un punto, si la dividimos, en el punto de la esclavitud sexual, yo agregaría que para lograr un apoyo eficaz a las víctimas, los estados tienen que invertir recursos en la capacitación de toda la gente que está formando parte del Estado y en la difusión o campañas que involucren la perspectiva de género para visibilizar el tema de la esclavitud sexual como un problema de género. Por eso digo que es importante dividirlo, porque desconozco si en el tráfico de órganos hay una cuestión de género, pero sí de infancia, por ejemplo, ¿no? Alguna de las cosas que señalaban es, le sucede más a niños que a adultos. En el caso de los trabajos forzados, no sé también cómo sea la estadística en cuanto a género, pero en el caso de la esclavitud sexual, el género es vital para entender que el 90% de las víctimas son mujeres adultas o niñas. Entonces, sí es vital que se sensibilice en esta cuestión, porque al menos en este tipo de esclavitud tiene que ver con la violencia contra las mujeres. Ya en la trata de, de órganos y en los trabajos forzados debe haber otros problemas de fondo estructurales que también sería importante que quienes comprenden a fondo estos fenómenos aportaran en líneas más específicas, porque creo que si no lo diferenciamos nos puede suceder algo que, que ha pasado con Palermo, que de pronto en una definición tenemos varias cosas y entonces queda muy general, pero no nos va a dar líneas de acción tan específicas. Eso. Ok, okay. First here and then back to you. Gracias. Eh, sumando eh, los esfuerzos que se están haciendo aquí, estoy contento, un, un poco tenso por todas la, la, las, las sesiones como se han dado, en, en, en algunas tensiones que he notado por ahí. Eh, después de trabajar mi violencia como varón y tratar de erradicarla, identifico mucho las tensiones. Eh, pese a eso, yo creo que ha sido un, un gran grupo de trabajo, eh, yo tengo dos ardillas, una la que está con ustedes y otra la que está eh, construyendo teorías y metodologías para implementarlas. Entonces, este, creo que ya hasta tuvieron hijitos porque andan muy revolucionadas mis ardillas. Pero lo, yo, yo lo que quisiera agregar en esto de la penalización del cliente es como ir más allá de, de, de lo que se está planteando aquí, porque no solo es la legislación, la legislación es una, una meta, y en esa meta tenemos que construir un, una cuestión estratégica. Entonces, además de la pen, penalización del cliente, sumado a lo que dice Ixchel, lo que dice también Marta Torres, tenemos que hacer una fuerte campaña de prevención. O sea, eh, si prevenimos, evitamos que las personas lleguen a delinquir o lleguen a consumir. ¿no? Entonces, una fuerte campaña de prevención tendría que estar eh, enfocada ¿no? a una sexualidad libre, de objetivización y mercantilización del cuerpo femenino y plantearlo como la principal causa de las diferentes violencias que se ejerce contra las mujeres. ¿no? ¿Y cómo lo, lo pienso estratégicamente? ¿no? Hay organizaciones de la sociedad civil que se han sumado a este esfuerzo que ha hecho el Papa. ¿no? Eh, también están los estados que han venido a los encuentros que hemos tenido acá y están ahora las iglesias y las parroquias. ¿no? Entonces, tenemos en el nivel estructural podemos llegar al rincón más alejado del mundo. ¿no? Entonces, si establecemos bien una campaña de prevención enfocada a la sexualidad, que es la causa de las diferentes violencias contra las mujeres, 
les vamos a ganar a, a los padrotes y a los consumidores. Es decir, lo digo porque en una experiencia en Estados Unidos, que es prohibicionista, y que no, no tienen el modelo sueco, pero implementaron una cosa que se llama John School, ¿no? o escuelas de clientes. Entonces, ahí, antes de meterlos a la cárcel, los, el, se los cambian por unas sesiones eh, de sensibilización y capacitación para evitar. ¿no? ¿Por qué digo que debemos empezar con la prevención? Porque estos clientes, lo que han demostrado los estudios, es que agarran bien la estrategia y se pueden camuflar, ¿no? entonces ya no los agarran tan fácilmente. ¿no? Entonces, es muy efectiva esta, esta estrategia solo con los clientes de primera vez, pero los que ya tienen varios años han creado sus estrategias para no ser arrestados. Entonces, también hay que cambiar el enfoque, hay que hacer unas academias de género con los clientes. Es decir, si yo lo pienso como perversamente, de, pensando como padrote. ¿no? Eh, entonces, si vamos a meter a todos los clientes a la cárcel, eh, se va más de la mitad de los hombres de este planeta a la cárcel. ¿no? Entonces, ¿qué, qué, ¿qué vamos a hacer en ese sentido? ¿no? Y, y eso es una cosa real. Yo creo que en más del 50% de los varones en el mundo es consumidor. ¿no? Sí, sí eso, eso es cierto, ¿no? Entonces, eso lo, me lo decía un padrote, por ejemplo, ¿no? A ver, Oscar, tú que has estás metido mucho en la erradicación de la trata, ¿cómo nos eliminarías? Yo le decía, pues arrancando de raíz, poniendo una bomba en el pueblo de productor de parotes, y me dijo, está mal, y yo sí, ¿por qué estoy mal? Dice, porque nuestras raíces están en todo el mundo, tendrías que poner una bomba en todo el mundo, ¿no? Entonces, por ahí, eh, pensar en esa lógica que tiene que ver cómo llegamos a las infancias para establecer una sexualidad libre de violencia, ¿no? en donde eh, dejemos de ver campañas, donde vemos a modelos, ¿no? y entonces también cómo somatizamos esos esquemas de dominación, y, y yo lo, no voy a decir quién, ¿no? pero viendo cuando las compañeras pasaban por aquí al frente, eh, eh, como que un hilo los jala para, para verle el cuerpo a las mujeres. ¿no? Entonces tenemos que empezar de, desde de construir nuestras propias masculinidades que están objetivizando y entender esas lógicas que están detrás de eso, detrás de los medios de comunicación, detrás del patriarcado. ¿no? Entonces, empecemos desde ahí y ocupemos todo esto que se está haciendo. ¿no? Y me voy esperanzado, yo llegué muy, muy triste, así como pensando, no, mejor me quedo este, trabajando porque hace falta el dinero y todo, pero eh, esto es inversión y inversión para el futuro. Gracias. Thank you. We're optimistic too. Hola. Bueno, primeramente eh, creo que mis compañeros que me antecedieron eh, pudieron explicar ya la importancia de poder penalizar al cliente. ¿no? Creo, estoy completamente de acuerdo. Y segundo, con el desarrollo de la carta, creo que nos falta un poquito de orden. Si queremos erradicar una problemática, tenemos que abordarlo de manera integral. Desde la prevención en el ámbito educativo, como decía Óscar, es de vital importancia desde la infancia, desde la primera infancia, también en lo educativo, en la formación del administrador de justicia, eh, en las personas que van a atender, desde el ámbito de comunicación, cómo a través de la comunicación podemos hacer para erradicar esta problemática, desde el ámbito laboral y desde el ámbito de seguridad ciudadana. Luego, tenemos que pasar por atención, y cuando me refiero a atención, tomar los principios internacionales de la debida diligencia para brindar un trato digno a las víctimas de no revictimización. Luego viene la prevención, la atención, la sanción. ¿Cómo exhortamos a los estados a que se pueda garantizar el acceso a la justicia de las víctimas como un derecho humano y a que se les pueda brindar eh, la tutela judicial efectiva? Que esta tutela judicial efectiva va a ir direccionada a la libertad de asentar una denuncia, que ellas puedan acercarse a asentar una denuncia que se cree en las palabras de las víctimas, también de que se pueda dictar una sanción para que no nos quedemos como en Bolivia con 2.500 denuncias y 44 sentencias, que se dé el cumplimiento de esa sentencia, ¿a qué se refiere esto? De que los padrotes, los padrotes y clientes sí puedan entrar a la cárcel. Y la verdad, eh, luego tenemos que hablar de la reparación del daño a las víctimas para no mandarlos por una vía civil en Bolivia, luego de terminar un proceso penal que puede durar hasta tres años, en el mejor de los casos, tiene que iniciarse un proceso paralelo de manera civil para que 
estos explotadores, estos delincuentes, reci recién le podamos exigir una reparación del daño, sino que el Estado pueda asumir esta responsabilidad. Así como el Estado lucra con la explotación de estas víctimas, así también el Estado pueda tener una caja de reparación para que pueda reparar en, en algo el daño causado a estas víctimas. Y establecer en un punto más que las pol políticas públicas, exhortar a los estados que puedan dictar políticas públicas con asignación de recursos económicos. Yo creo eh, que deberíamos de realizar un abordaje más integral. Está, está bien lo que está escrito, solo ordenarlo. En, en un punto, por ejemplo, habla... Eh, del apoyo a las víctimas a incluir el derecho a permanecer en el país, al trabajo, el acceso a la justicia, dice, ¿no? Prioridad en el enjuiciamiento penal y también habla de justicia. Entonces, tal vez poder juntarlo y unificarlo, pero que se establezca bien claro. Perdón si hablo como abogada, pero sí también pedir que se endurezcan las penas para los explotadores. A mí, 10 y 15 años para un explotador, no, no es suficiente. Quiero, perdón, sí soy muy legalista, pero quiero más, quiero la pena máxima, quiero 30 años, porque también las sentencias tienen que ser ejemplarizadoras. Gracias. Yeah, please. I was going to say, let's start with getting more sentences, period. It, as much as I really agree, very much, with we have to be harsh and for the consumer and for the trafficker. We have to be very, very harsh. I'm thinking that the traffickers usually have a great deal of money and assets. I'm thinking the consumer doesn't. If I take a consumer and I put him in jail for 20 years, I take everything he has, now I've got a new problem. I have a wife and four children at home and someone's got to take care of them. And As, as much as I agree, I, I think we need to be careful how we do it so we appear to be realistic. And uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. If it was just the man, adios, okay? But we, we may create another whole subset of children who are now homeless and vulnerable because dad's in prison, whatever hut they lived in or whatever money they had was taken away And now these children are being sold as own children. And, and, and I don't have the answer to it, and I'm, and I'm not saying back off. I'm just saying I hope we can appear to be realistic when we approach it that way. First, uh, Sister Leah had her hand up, then I see uh, Pam <coughs> in the back, and then... I find really good to meet here and to exchange ideas and to know each other and perhaps networking in future. But I would make really a stress on criminalization of the clients and, the, uh, and um, traffickers. For me, it's not to give them a high, the, the clients a high uh, punishment It's to change their thinking. And the thinking in prostitution is, I am the master and I made with your body what I like. And that is the thinking and this thinking must change. We are created in the name of God, man, woman, and we are equal. And prostitu prostitution doesn't go in it. And We must criminalize, uh, crim criminalize uh, the clients and uh, the traffickers. To see that is unjust. We speak that prostitution is a crime. And then we are so shy to criminalize the ones who are on the roof, root, roots of the roofs, roots Ooh. of this criminalization. Mm -hmm. So I feel it very important. And the saying in the states, most of the states, are uh, the, the ministers and all these people are men. So when we reach that 
it's criminalized, I think it's the possibility that they reflect on that. And I would really find it so good <clears throat> if we could put that on the first place just to make another thinking that we help the women, that we resettle them, that we give all the help, that is clear enough. But we must be also very clear to say that is a criminal act and the, the ones, but we have no bias, we have no market. So the buyers are making the market and we must criminalize, criminalize the buyers. That I would really uh, uh, emphasis on that because I see I have seen what's going on when we uh, just legalize everything that's very easy for the state to legalize uh, and the other day there was also a medicine doctor she says since 10 years she looks after the women who are in prostitution but since two years she looks also after the clients, and I was astonished, and she said, yes, all the, the, the sickness that the women get, the clients get also, and they bring it in their families, and the children are suffer suffering of that. So I ask myself, what a construct of a society if we are not able to say that is a crime, and the one who are buying is a criminal, and he has to be uh, pen penalized, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. First Pamela and then Linda. Bueno, este, bueno, no, lo que escuchaba este, era que pues, no hay que castigar tan duramente a los clientes porque realmente no tienen el suficiente dinero y se quedarían los hijos huérfanos. Pero digo, o sea, no tienen dinero para, para, este, para pagar a las víctimas, contándome, pero sí para andar violando a las niñas y a las jóvenes. Entonces, si tienen dinero para eso, tienen dinero para, para pagar. Y pues realmente, este, si no quieren dejar eh, huérfanos a sus hijos, pues simplemente tienen que educarse y no andar comprando a personas para sus instintos viles de violar a una, una persona. Gracias. Thank you. Linda, please, and then Abraham, I saw your hand up, and then. I would want us to be actually doing and saying things which were in our power to enact. And whilst I might want the highest possible sentences I'm a lifelong abolitionist. I make no secret of it. I think we're in danger of moving towards dream pages that we were talking about earlier. We need to spend time specifically on some of these issues. And I think our challenge would be to say, let's commit to moving forward by having particular focuses on some of these issues and looking then at action plans that we can enact, which, is, which are about challenging ourselves and challenging church and challenging states. And I think it may well be that we decide that we set up working groups that will meet more than once and move forward. I don't know. But, but I would far rather us be looking pragmatically at what we can do and what we can then enable something to be achieved than wandering away from here and think we've solved something by creating a sentence on a piece of paper. To me, that, that doesn't resolve. But alongside of that, and, and each of these areas are very specialist, which I think we have recognized, and we have passions about many of them, people in this room. I would want to take us back to um, the famous 8.7, and I really don't want to get myself started on that because I have some issues with the lines 8.7 and other issues. However, I think I would want to challenge the Pontifical Academy to look at whether or not it's possible to set up an observatory that calls nation states to account. Because going forward, we have until 2030, and to begin to look at what is going on in nation states, 
to work with experts from those countries, but to be creating a possibility of where we're looking at the violations. We're looking at what nation states commit themselves to doing and then don't enact. I believe it's within our power to do something like that and to actually have some impact. Because we can't, we can call countries and, and encourage and urge and try to force countries towards specific legislations and increasing sentences, etc. But actually, the teeth are not there and they were never there within the SDGs because each country sets its own standards, etc. So I think we just need to look at what else we can do and then perhaps work with NGOs in the nation states to use the UN system to look at the universal periodic reviews, to look at CEDAW, etc., and use those and put teeth within those. I think we can do that and there are other areas of the world that have begun some of that work in terms of putting some of those measurements in. So I, I would urge us to be doing things that are pragmatic, that can make a difference. Really has to be cleared up. We, your we, Linda, and I'm not getting at you, but your we is not the same we as the Academy. There are precisely two members of the Academy here. Now, you are all free beings. Well, I am also a member. Uh, not, no, you're, you're, John, you and you're a member of the Council, you're not a member it's, of the Academy. It's true that you don't give me any kind of position with me in one. I was the person to organize the meeting. This is very clear uh, for all people. No, but you, I also mean better I'm, I'm sorry, you were not the person to organize the meeting. Jamie and I but, did that. But, but this is not I the can show this with This is name. not the time for this discussion. The point being that this is an academy. An academy of experts. Now, many of you have spoken up as though you are great supporters of the so-called Nordic model. In fact, um, Norway does not like this term. The social scientists in Norway disavow this term. In fact, there have been precisely one and a half evaluative studies done on the Swedish legislation, which has been adopted in Norway uh, certainly, the outcome of the first evaluative study was very positive in terms of diminishing demand among the under 35s. Now, that was the only ca demographic category that was distinguished. We do track the nation states in, in the academy. We had the guy here who conducted that evaluative exercise and he was the first person to admit that, that this was preliminary research. It was not something on which, which to base policy statements. It needed replicating, it needed refining, it needed doing in other places to see whether you've got the same results. So as a social scientist, as the ex-president of the World Association of Sociologists, I would say be very careful about signing up to unfinished research. Support it, follow it, watch it, do all of those things, but don't prejudge what the outcome is going to be. France clearly hopes uh, that the same results will be obtained in France. We don't know. We cannot prejudge. It would be very unscientific to do so. So all I can say is that since a lot of you are in support of this, rooting for it, hoping it works in one form or another, form yourself into some association. Put the pressures that you want to exert on the UN, on whoever you please, you will be a free body don't try and link it to the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. It's not scientific, it's ideological. Margaret, I didn't ask for that. 
I would just want it to be clear mm. that was not what I was asking there. No, I no, said it wasn't nothing Linda. about you. I haven't mentioned the Nordic model at any point. No, no, I'm very I careful wasn't. in what I was asking. Mm. I was clearly asking about an observatory relating to, as a suggestion, 8.7. In addition to that, I was suggesting there are unresolved questions that relate to many of these issues, of which could be prostitution, trade in organs, forced labour. I believe that they may very well, the usefulness of drilling down in some of those areas. I'm not, that was not presuming where the Pontifical Academy would go. And I would say for myself, I am involved in lobbying the UN and have been for many, many years. Fine. I've also written to the Pope. I know, I know my responsibilities and I'm involved. My question here wasn't that. I deliberately didn't ask that, Margaret. I was very clear in what I was asking. So when you responded to me suggesting that I was suggesting a we in that case, I didn't do it. I was very clear in what I was asking. had their hand up that I've been ignoring you. Please raise it high. Thank you. Good to meet you. Stella and then directly behind you. Yeah. I'm considering, I looked at the chatter we have beautiful, once we include some of these few main suggestions here, I think we have a beautiful blueprint. But the only thing I'm asking is, is it, is it possible to include, include in any portion the actions of some governments, lukewarm attitude or misgovernance that is increasing the source? Because I can see these things more where you say states should do this, states should do that. Yes, generally all states. But there sh we should include states also, should work hard to ensure they either minimize or block the surge of trafficking. That's all, thank you. Thank you. I observed and heard the contributions, and I felt we are lacking out of an uh, issue of advocacy, of which a sensitive element like we are discussing needs to be advocated very well, which is my background. I feel the resolution we are going to take out of here uh, should be on the media more than it used to be before. I'm from the National Council of Women's Societies, Nigeria. And in Nigeria, we are at the federal level and in the 36 states from the, plus the federal capital territory of the nation, we have presidents all over the states. We have presidents at the local government level and at world level. We control the women in Nigeria. Every other NGO is under us and Whenever we take decision, it goes. So we need advocacy so that we decentralize whatever we are discussing here. And also we need to use the uh, musicians, the filmmakers, to make it in a form of uh, playlets that this is what we want. I want us to consider how it was during the uh, slave trading. It came to end because people took it serious and they found so many avenues as to how they combat it. So we need to look at it holistically that way and come with force. It's, it should be looked at and then we'll take same direction so that this will not just be discussed and then they are on the pages of paper and we are not able to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sister Patricia and then Joseph. I just want to buttress the point that Stella made. That's why I was putting up my hand. Because this document, looking at it, is 
quite good. A lot of effort has gone into it. But it's mostly for countries of destination. And when I was thinking about countries of origin, the countries of source, something has to be done. And that's why I want to buttress her point. If we could put in something that can make the countries, especially the governments, accountable. And this is why emphasis, because in countries of origin, I take Nigeria, for example, because that's the one I know very well. That's why it's very, very important to involve the church, the conference of bishops. Because one of the things, if the bishops were as committed as the Pope himself, or Monsignor Sorondo here, and when you talk about, for example, in Nigeria, the priest in charge of human trafficking is the priest responsible for caritas. And he, he, you know, for him, caritas are the so social issues, and human trafficking is, is very little on his agenda. So that when it comes to February 8th, even to get him to act and all that. So please, build in something for the countries of origin so that there'll be some accountability, the government should be held accountable, and as we were discussing, well, that is in our own country, will involve the media to draw. For example, let me just share this, sorry to, yesterday about 26 Nigerian girls perished at Lampedusa to tell you the seriousness of this, you know, like, I, I don't know, the seriousness of this. So a lot has to be done in the countries of origin. Thank, thank, you. thank you for that. Yes. Um, can, I, can I just make a, a comment? Yes, thank you for that. I think it's a very, uh, you make an important point. And I think in 2015, the Academy had some recommendations, precisely those points. And I'm very happy to bring those into the document uh, for precisely the reasons you've outlined. I think it's a very useful intervention. I'm grateful for it. Um, I'm conscious of the time, and I don't want the conversation to be closed down, but I'm also conscious of the fact that I've got um, a lot of writing and tweaking and bits and pieces to do. Um, Joseph, uh, you've got something to say, and then just a couple of other people towards thank the Thank you. I won't take too much time. Yeah, thank you. Um, really enjoyed hearing a lot of these uh, points and suggestions. Um, if you indulge me for a moment, there was something that I read last night that kind of re relates to my thought process on this. Uh, I was reading about a general, General Maxis from the Roman army. Um, he led his troops against Hannibal, um, but he knew that if he attacked Hannibal directly, he would be destroyed. So he attacked the supply lines, and he's had all these little battles, and then that helped him actually defeat Hannibal. So I think that that should be our philosophy here, and that if we want to go after prostitution, we don't go directly after prostitution, we go after the pieces underneath that will make it crumble upon itself. So I'm just gonna bring this home to my particular point and where I think we can get the most traction for money laundering. In December of 2016, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution, resolution I believe it was uh, 2331, and what this resolution said, it was uh, condemning human trafficking in relation to the Islamic State and Daesh and, and um, the, uh, the, the, the in-state and Boko Haram as well. But they, what they attached onto that was they encouraged member states across the board to work with private sector and women's groups and the FATF, which is the Financial Action Task Force, to disrupt financial chains. So I would like to see a reference there to further the UN to say, let's push this agenda forward again and get the FATF, which yes. oversees all the financial intelligence units, including FinTrack in Canada, to say, we want to see more on this. Yes. We want to see more pressure on the governing body of the world of all the financial intelligence units yes. to disrupt human trafficking's financial flows. So I think if we, if we bring it home to that resolution and remind them about that, at least if we meet again next year, we continue to push them forward on that agenda. Uh, Joseph, you make a very good point. Uh, resolution 2311 is very important. You make the link back to the Islamic State, but also the connectivity between the different parts of the whole problem. I think that's a very good model, and I will um, be happy to incorporate that into the uh, material. So thank you for that. A few words. Well, yes. Um, vorrei ringraziare, vorrei ringraziare questa altissima accademia per questa grande opportunità e 
e anche di aver chiamato persone che eh, vivono l'università della strada, quella a fianco agli ultimi, agli ultimi degli ultimi. E quindi vorrei ringraziare per questo, questa possibilità di stare eh, in questa scuola di vita dove ricordiamo che tutti i nostri interventi sono per loro, per le vittime, per, il, per cercare come eh, aiutarle a liberarsi da questo terribile gioco. E allora quando parliamo di crimini non vedo perché dobbiamo aver paura di nominare i criminali, perché i crimini hanno dei criminali e i criminali vanno chiamati per nome. Così come fece Papa Francesco quando venne nella nostra casa famiglia, una università domestica, e chiese perdono per tutti quei cristiani che avevano commesso questi crimini. Andate a riascoltare il suo discorso dell'anno scorso. Allora, sono d'accordo con quello che ha detto Roy eh, di inserire nel, nella dichiarazione l'impegno concreto dei Vescovi, che sia citato il cliente come primo responsabile di questa sciagura della tratta e che, come diceva eh, lui, eh, Haugen, eh, che ci sia questo cambiamento di mentalità nella formazione e direi aggiungere anche a partire dalle scuole perché sono i nostri, le nuove generazioni che... Sorry, we, we eh, haven't a translation of what you're saying, so uh, okay. what I suggest is we can, we can come to what you want to say after the meeting over dinner, okay. but we haven't so a translation. So I finish only to ask uh, uh, a question to Father uh, Sorondo because I didn't understand uh, what he think about uh, this uh, declaration and uh, I would like to, und to understand what he think about this uh, declaration. I don't understand why uh, you don't uh, uh, say nothing. Please, if you can say your thinking about this. Yes, of course, always. <laughs> because <laughs> you are the chairman. Oh, yes, go on, Marcello. No, I think, yo pienso verdaderamente que lo de los clientes es absolutamente necesario ponerlo y no nos podemos ir de aquí sin la afirmación de los chairman de que lo van a poner. De lo contrario, se pueden hacer la Academia de las Ciencias, que es la que inventa este método y que está fundada hace 400 años. Cuando no hay un acuerdo, hace dos documentos. Uno de la mayoría, que pienso que es la que dice que hay que incorporar, y otro de la minoría. Los chairman son chairman, no son dictadores, tienen que escuchar la voz de los participantes. No es verdad que no sea científico el decir que el modelo sueco o nórdico eh, no es bueno. Hay mil científicos que lo dicen a partir de la canciller de Suecia, que es profesora. Yo no sé qué dice la Asociación de Sociólogos, pero en esto es de imaginar que puede decir la Asociación de Sociólogos. No son los únicos científicos de las ciencias sociales. De modo que la academia como tal no se expresa y no se ha expresado en este punto. Alguna persona en la academia se puede expresar, pero nada más. Okay. I think this may be the last intervention because we really want to go to dinner uh, at the back. Yes. We have been talking about legislation, how to take care of these children's needs and so on and so forth. But one thing we have failed to address, just to buttress what Sister Patricia and Mrs. Odife said, these children coming into the country, we have not addressed how they come into this country, like the embassies, and uh, some of them, you know, they, 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 they come by sea and so on and so forth. When we are writing this uh, communique, I think uh, we should at least take note of this. Like uh, the embassies, you know, should be controlled. 
Tell them they should know the type of uh, visas they give to these children. And even our sea, or uh, wherever they come through, I think should be well guarded. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I hope everyone's had a chance, at least must feel that they've had a voice to express things and uh, exchange views, dialogue, and so on. Um, all I can say is that um, many of the good points made, I will try as far as I can to incorporate them into a final draft. That will take a little bit of time because some of the points are quite complicated and I have to check material and facts before I put it into a, do a document. But a draft will be prepared as a result of the dialogue and discussion here. And I thank everyone for the time they've taken and also the uh, degree in which they've been willing to uh, tolerate uh, at very short notice um, a discussion of a paper which, as you can tell, needs more work on it. But uh, that's the purpose of why we're here today. So thank you. Uh, Marcello, yes? Prego. No, no es una, una cuestión genérica que, te, que debes decir que alguno de los puntos, otros no. Yo quiero saber si van a incorporar el punto de la condena a los clientes. Quiero saber si lo van a incorporar o no, porque es muy importante. Además, es la opinión de la mayoría. Well, that, that point is already made in the sense that um, if you read the preamble, it's quite clear that um, the wording says crimes should be recognized should penalize in order to eradicate them. Um, if someone wants to put a, another few sentences to that, I'm happy to consider it, of course, but it is, seems to me explicitly clear uh, what the Holy Father has said. There's no ambiguity about it. Um, a crime against humanity is at the highest level of condemnation. Uh, there is no higher. And I think that is itself a, an incredible achievement because the Holy Father, quite rightly, has put that at the apex of our discussions. It may need a further explanation of what the crime against humanity means, uh, you know, but it is clear to me that that is at the highest level of uh, condemnation, and it, it exactly says what you've said, Marcello, it is utterly unambiguous about where we stand on that. No, no uh, yo pienso que no es suficiente. Sorry, sorry. I think that is not enough. Okay. We need to put explicitly, like you put, the two sentences are very generic. Yes. It's, this is more precise, and it's better to prevenir that curar, say okay. in Spanish. That's, that's fair enough. Okay, I, so, I will take a sentence and uh, we'll put it in. I can write the okay. sentence. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. Um, as you know, this will be a um, continuing dialogue. Uh, but thank you for your help and understanding. Thank you. Oh,